Okay. Um, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining uh, this special edition <laughs> of the GES Colloquium. Um, as many of you, I'm sure, have been participating in the normal um, Genetic Engineering and Society Center Colloquia that we've been con we conduct during the academic year. Um, however, there's been some recent events uh, with regard to the regulation of GM crops, which is what we're going to talk about today. And um, we've got uh, our, our GES Center um, has a lot of expertise uh, on this specific topic, and we felt that this was a really opportune time um, to have a discussion uh, with, with the GES community and other folks who are interested in participating about um, just different perspectives on what that rule means and, um, and different interpretations of it. Um, so we're really uh, happy to see so many people join. We've got over 70 people, over 70 participants uh, logged into the Zoom call right now. Um, so that's great for, for being during the summer. Um, just a couple of uh, ground, rules, ground rules before just Zoom functionality, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with by this, by this point, uh, before I introduce our speakers. Um, so the key thing is that with the colloquium, uh, with this many participants on a Zoom meeting, um, the way we're going to handle comments um, and when, when we do move into discussion is using the raise hand function. And so if you open, uh, if you're a listener, if you open the chat uh, box or press on the chat icon, um, sorry, I'm wrong, uh, press on the participants icon, uh, you, will see, uh, you will see the option to raise your hand. And both myself and Patty Mulligan, who's the communications director for the Genetic Engineering and Society Center, will be monitoring uh, participants looking for folks raising their hands during that discussion um, section. Um, and I'll also be watching the chat box too, if, if you feel more comfortable uh, asking a question through chat. So we'll be, we'll be taking questions both over uh, with the raise hand function and with the chat. Uh, Patty also want, was uh, mentioning that uh, we are recording this meeting. Um, so we have video and audio of the meeting um, and we will be posting that video uh, and audio uh, recording to the GES Center website. Um, as well as the slides, we each speaker has a, a small number of slides that they're uh, bringing with their with their comments, um, and those slides will also be posted on the website as well um, after we're all done with this. Um, so again, thank you for coming. Um, we're really looking forward to having this discussion. Let me just go through our speakers very briefly and introduce uh, who's going to be participating on the panel um, in order of their appearance, I believe. Um, so Jennifer Kuzma is a co-director of the Genetic uh, Engineering and Society Center, and she's also a Goodnight NC uh, GSK Foundation Distinguished Professor in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, Fred Gould is a William Neal uh, Neil Reynolds Professor of Agriculture, as well as a Genetic Engineering and Society Center co-director. Uh, we'll then be hearing from Keith Edmonston, who's a professor in Crop and Soil Sciences. Uh, followed by Heike Sederoff, who's a professor in plant and microbial biology. Um, Jason Delborn, who is a professor of science policy and society, uh, as well as a member of the Genetic Engineering and Society uh, Center Executive Committee. Uh, followed by Todd Kukin, who is a research scholar in the Genetic Engineering and Society Center and an environmental scientist uh, by training. Uh, and then Kara Krieger is uh, now an assistant professor in the Department of Applied Ecology at uh, NC State, as well as a member of the GES Center Executive Committee. So that's our panel. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer. Okay, I'm assuming everybody can hear me and can see my, my screen, at least the... Um non-slideshow version, which I'll switch to the slideshow in just a second here. All right, how's that looking for everybody, okay? Can you nod your head, Cara? Okay, good. I can only see Cara in my little window on the, in the corner there. Um, so first of all, thank you again for coming. We recognize that there's a lot going on in the world in our country today with COVID and, and the protests and the important societal issues that we're facing right now. Um, hopefully this will be a nice um, respite from all that. Um, the secure rule, USDA's new rule is not you know, the most important issue our country faces right now, but it certainly is a big change in um, how USDA is going to regulate uh, genetically 
modified or genetically engineered crops in the future. And so we felt it was important to have this seminar. I do have a disclaimer though, that um, we are academics trying to understand the new rule. And although we have decades of experience working with GM crop regulation and genetic engineering and societal issues, we don't claim to have all the answers about the details or the impacts of the rule on different sectors. And so we're basically hosting this seminar for discussion purposes, to give you our perspectives just from reading it and from our experience, and then to have a Q&A session with you all afterwards. So my topic is to bring you through uh, USDA oversight under the coordinated framework for the regulation of, of biotechnology from the past to the present. So I will try to do this all in um, 10 minutes. We'll see how it goes. So here is a figure that is somewhat complex and it's purposefully complex in a way because the coordinated framework for the regulation of biotechnology, which was um, a policy document under the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, was written in 1986. It wasn't a law, it wasn't a rule, um, but it was a policy document that instructed primarily three federal agencies, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, to take existing laws that were already on the books and use them to regulate the new products of biotechnology, which at the time were largely confined to genetically engineered microbes, such as the ice minus bacterium, or to genetically engineered plants and the first kind of plants that were coming out in the late 80s and early 90s. So under this policy document, the agencies then had to interpret their laws that applied to the products that they typically governed under, um, they had to interpret these laws and promulgate rules specifically for genetically engineered or biotech products. So I'm going to ignore animals today and I'm going to ignore microbes for, for this and just focus on plants because for the secure rule, it primarily changes what we do for plants. Um, and so plants between 1986 coordinated framework and pretty much today with some modifications have been uh, regulated by USDA under the Plant Pest Act. And uh, USDA was able to use uh, an old law that dates back to 1957 called the Federal Plant Pest Act to regulate these plants primarily because they were made with sequences from agrobacterium and cauliflower mosaic virus. Now, agrobacterium is a plant pest itself. And so genetic engineers borrowed genetic sequences from this bacteria and used them to insert genes into plants, kind of as a carrier that could uh, jump the gene and move it into the plant. Uh, so this was somewhat of a regulatory hook for USDA to regulate uh, genetically engineered plants under the Plant Pest Act. And so USDA took on most genetically engineered plants but EPA also had a role to play under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. Can you, I hope you can see my little cursor. This is the um, box I'm referring to here. And so EPA does have a role for some genetically engineered plants if they have pesticidal-like proteins, uh, which are now called plant-incorporated protectants or PIPs. And the most prominent uh, one, types of these proteins are come from the bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis, which uh, kill certain insect pests. And if you put the protein from this bacterium into a plant, uh, you can reduce your use of pesticides. So that was the EPA's role, which is somewhat limited to these plant incorporated protectants. So USDA plant pest, primarily because of DNA sequences that were used in the engineering process, and EPA plant pesticides, uh, primarily BT. Now, in the early 2000s to 2010, we started to see more and more crops being developed without the use of plant pest sequences. Um, and this was po made possible by gene editing, and I'll show you a slide on that in a few minutes. Um, but it was also made possible by gene guns or using more biolistic or brute force methods to get genes into plant cells. So that's what is has typically gone through something called the USDA inquiry process or MI regulated process. Not technically regulated under the Plant Pest Act, but the developers have double checked with USDA to make sure that that's not the case. I'll talk about that more in a little bit. So that essentially divides the plants up. Now, if a plant, genetically engineered plant, is going to animal food or feed, FDA also has a role. And that's at the top of the slide where my cursor is right now under the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. 
Uh, so they look at novel substances put into plants from biotechnology. However, they decided to take an approach that was a voluntary approach. So a developer will submit certain safety studies about the nutritional equivalency, the maybe metabolic equivalency, according to some parameters that may be toxic, um, might uh, submit some information about the allergenicity if it's a protein, uh, but the FDA doesn't really make a determination of safety. The developer submits this information and FDA says we have no further questions. So the premise of the coordinated framework was really that the products of biotechnology don't bear any more or less risk than the products of conventional breeding. And so therefore we don't need new laws. And it's the product that should be the focus of the regulatory system, not the process. Although in operation, that's not exactly how it turned out to be because we do focus on the process of genetic engineering to capture the products initially. Okay, with that, um, I'm going to move on. And again, this is just to show you the regulatory hook for USDA were these tDNA sequences that would flank your gene of interest, the black thing right there where my cursor is, and help you to move eventually that gene, the black gene of interest into the plant. So that was the regulatory hook for a long time. However, now I'm gonna show this slide with gene edit editing. Um, you know, in the 2000s-ish to 2010, we had more and more uh, plant de biotech developers using gene editing technologies. And this isn't only CRISPR, it can be things called talons or zinc finger nucleases, where these proteins, which are nuclease proteins, would make a cut in the DNA. They would bind to certain regions of the DNA, so you could make very targeted changes. If you didn't put any donor DNA template, the host might repair it by itself which is this column, the leftmost column on your screen. Um, that's homologous, just direct repair. The, the host uses its own repair machinery. That might result in a mutation though. And so that can be used as an engineering technique to get point mutations. The other option is to provide a template with a tiny little change in it, that little orange piece. And then the, after the cut is made, that template will be copied into that spot and you'll get a genetic change that is more that you designed is more targeted, or you can put entirely new transgenes into crops using this site-directed um, nuclease methodology as well. So this is an, in a nutshell gene editing. So you can see through either biolistic methods or through gene editing, we didn't have to use plant pest DNA sequences anymore. So this essentially summarizes USDA's old regulatory pathway. Um, the main question is, is there plant pest DNA? or is the organism itself a plant pest, like agrobacterium? Um, if yes, then a, a crop would be um, submitted for a permit for field trial. If it's a crop we've dealt with in the past, it might be just a notification to the agency for a field trial. And then after a certain time in field trial, it would become what we would call deregulated. In other words, it would be cleared for interstate commerce and you could move it on the market. However, many crops from about 2005-ish to the present have gone through this MI regulated process because they don't contain in the end product any plant pest DNA sequences. And I looked this morning and there were about 97 that had been submitted um, and I think most of them cleared. So I'm going to say is, you know, over 60 cleared, I think is a safe assumption there, even though I haven't looked at each one. Um, so th that's the old regulatory path. Now, this am, am I regulated process, you can go to the website, it's very transparent, which I, I have to commend the agency on that. Um, and you can find the different submissions here, and you can find the company, and then you can view the letter that the company submitted to the USDA and USDA's response letter. So I just picked out one of the letters. I think this is a soybean resistant to a cis nematode. Um, and USDA, this is what USDA replies back in a letter. It says it doesn't contain DNA sequences derived from plant pests. And therefore, it inconsistent. It doesn't come regulated under um, 7 CFR Part 340, which is what we'll be talking about and what has been revised in the SECURE Act. Okay. So um, that's the process up till today. It's been interesting to kind of observe this over time in USDA's attempt to revise their process. Um, so what this slide shows on the very left-hand side are that USDA's initial regulations in 1987 and 1994, the plant pest um, rules that they put out, 
um, came only under the Federal Plant Pest Act, okay? So there are initial rules, but however, in 2000, this was amended and its authorities were combined with the Noxious Weed Act authorities into the new Plant Protection, I think that should be Plant Protection Act, sorry about that, but the PPA of 2000. So USDA twice before the secure rule has tried to update its regulation in light of this consolidative um, consolidation of the plant pest authorities and the noxious weed authorities in the law. They've tried to update their rules in 2008 at the end of the Bush II administration and in 2017 at the end of the Obama administration, the very end, like the last week, I think it was. And here, both these attempts tried to invoke both the noxious weed and the plant pest authorities. So the first thing I wanna point out about the SECURE rule is that it only really um, activates the plant pest risk authorities. So it decided not to activate the noxious weed act authorities. And that has been a point of consternation for some people because a lot of the first generation risks from GM crops had to do with weediness, like for example, the creeping bent grass and um, contamination of irrigation ditches in the um, Pacific Northwest region. Okay, so here's the SECURE Act in a nutshell. Here are the main features. Um, it is, uh, I'm not gonna read the title, it's the SECURE Act, um, but you can see the title on your slide. Um, so this is the updated USDA regulations under this new uh, Plant Protection Act. Um, so it, it pertains to organisms modified through genetic engineering. Well, what is the definition of genetic engineering? It's techniques that use recombinant, synthesized, or amplified nucleic acids to modify or create a genome. Okay, so technically it, it includes gene editing because you're using some, you're using that uh, CRISPR machinery, which is recombinantly generated. However, you'll see that some categories of gene editing are now exempt. So first of all, the main thing about the act is that it shifts from the mere presence of plant pest DNA sequences to a focus on plant pest risk. Um, and the definition of a plant pest um, is an organism that can directly or indirectly injure, cause damage, or cause disease in any plant or plant product. Uh, that's the brief definition. So several categories of under secure are going to be exempt. Um, ones that are already reviewed by e USDA, either through the MI regulated process or the permit and de deregulation process. If something has the same plant, host, the same trait, and the same mode of action, it will also be exempt. And so it's not dependent on the specific transgenic or otherwise insertion event. Okay, So it's not an event-by-event event regulation anymore. Now, gene editing categories are going to be exempt, but not all of them. Single-base, DNA-based pair substitutions are exempt. Host repair, remember I talked about SD1, is that host repair mechanisms? Or if the change is already in the gene pool of that plant species. But multiple edits are not going to be exempt. Now those are the main categories of exemption. USDA also has a process for uh, uh, putting forth additional categories of exemption over time. And so if your trait has, has otherwise, can otherwise be achieved by conventional breeding, USDA has a particular review process for it as well, and it may become exempt. So those are the exemptions. However, if it's not in those exemptions, a regulatory status review will take place. And that's gonna be kind of a key point of decision-making um, whether it has a potential plant pest risk. Now, USDA expects about 99% of crops to stop at the RSR. Weediness will be considered, but it won't be a determinating risk for regulatory capture. That's how I read it. Um, if there's no prob probable plant pest risk, it'll be cleared and exempt from regulation. If there is a sp suspected plant pest risk, it needs to go through a full permitting process. And that would be published in the Federal Register and up for notice and comment. Um, and then it, if it's granted a permit, it may be restricted to certain geographic locations or um, in, to be, uh, to be uh, grown in certain ways. 
all GM plants that are engineered to produce pharmaceutical or industrial substances will go straight to the permit process. Okay, so here is the, the graphical summary of all this um, here. And I know I'm running out of time. I had a lot of ground to cover, so I apologize. But this is the graphical um, summary of it. The yellow are kind of where you can self-determine if you want. The blue is where USDA has a role in determining or determining, excuse me, determining. Um, the uh, orange is something that would be, um, you know, a full-blown plant pest risk assessment process. The dark green are things that we're not going to have a public, from my reading, a public database of the, the exemptions. Now, if USDA creates another category of exemption because it otherwise could have been achieved by conventional breeding, they are going to publish a list of those on the website, and it looks like they're also going to go through a comment process in the Federal Register. So um, one concern of mine is that the regulatory status review is not going to go through a comment process in the Federal Register. That's just one of my concerns. So here are the pros and cons in, my, um, in the world, according to, to me, um, to Jennifer. The pros, I think, are a shift to the plant pest risk focus and away from the presence of plant pest DNA. There's a somewhat tiered approach to exempt things with which we have experience. And there's provisioning of public information and Federal Register comment for some categories. However, cons, in my opinion, are failure to invoke the noxious weed provisions of the PPA. Um, exemptions have little to do with product risk. For example, a single base pair substitution might activate a toxin. Um, and so it's not the amount of DNA change that really has much to do with risk. Um, and the lack of public information for some categories, uh, such as the self or USDA confirmed exemptions, um, and a lack of a formal assessment and comment period for the RSR. You can find this uh, graphic on your website, on the USDA's website, for how they're going to roll out the rule. I'm not going to go over that, um, but if effectively the MI regulated process is going to go away this summer, and then they're going to transition to the RSR process in um, 2021. So USDA estimates an annual cost saving to private industry from this of about $8 million, um, and a cost to APHIS about $3.5 million, which is how they justify the rule. They didn't have to do a full-blown cost-benefit analysis because it wasn't suspected to be over $100 million of impact. And I'll stop there. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Fred. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, so uh, Jennifer, thank you. That was a great introduction. And I'm gonna try to pick up uh, from some of the things that Jennifer said. And as I've been said, I'm gonna talk about the scientific issues. So I wanna go back to um, uh, what was called the NRC, but part of the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine report from 2002, where we reviewed the um, APHIS regulations. And basically there was one general comment I thought that was useful. Risk analysis of transgenic plants must continue to fill two distinct uh, things, technical support for regulatory decision-making and establishment and maintenance of regulatory legitimacy. And uh, those are both very important things. And I'm gonna restrict myself to talking about the technical support for regulatory decision-making. Um, others will talk about both of these two things, but they actually do intergrade between the two of them because they influence each other. And I think we have to deal with that issue. But what I want to get to in this uh, report, actually, I was the chair of this committee. Uh, this is a, a quote from it. The committee finds ab about uh, APHIS regulations that it should be possible to relatively quickly screen modified plants for potential environmental risks and then conduct detailed tests on only the subset of plants where preliminary screening indicates potential risk. And I think this is important in terms of viewing uh, how this relates to the changes uh, with the APHIS regulation. So this is only a personal view on this. Uh, and I think that APHIS regulation of new crop varieties and specifically plants through the new Plant Pest Act with or without the noxious weed authority, because Jennifer made that clear that there's some ambiguity here about what their authority is. But I feel that it's very appropriate, but it's actually mostly irrelevant today. And I know that may sound kind of weird, but I think that there are few, can you see my pointer here? 
Yeah, I, uh, Kara's uh, my. Uh, <laughs> All right. There are a few consequential risks that are addressed by the new act that are not supposed to be covered by EPA and FDA. And I can get into that in more detail. And as Jennifer said, AFA should continue to regulate plants engineered to make pharmaceuticals and industrial compounds. But I want to go back to in, in the comments uh, of the uh, APHIS in terms of this new rule. Uh, they said, we anticipate that most plants that are not eligible for exemptions and do not pose a plant pest risk will pass through the RSR, the regulatory status review process, quickly. Okay. And that's an important piece. And some people might wonder what, you know, if that's okay, what, what is that? And I, I guess what I need to get down to is a reason for all of my comments is that in again, one of the comments in response to the Federal Register uh, comments in that document states very clearly that APHIS does not regulate farming practices, right? So they're just, con you know, they, that all of this coordinated framework gave USDA, the only regulatory piece for USDA was through APHIS, which is the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services. They're not there to regulate farming practices, whether you use glyphosate or other things like that, whether uh, monarch butterflies are uh, impacted or covered by EPA. So basically what they're saying is that USDA itself has the National Resources Conservation Service, and they have incentive programs to to promote sustainable farming. But what they're saying is that they have a technical limit in terms of what they regulate. So with all of those limits, there really is very little that they are regulating that EP, anything that uh, involves a new spraying uh, because you have a, a herbicide tolerant crop and you're gonna use a new herbicide that's covered by EPA. If you have a plant that has a BT toxin in it, that's covered by EPA. If you have a uh, a plant pathogen resistant variety that's covered by EPA. Um, so all of these things take away what it is that they're actually doing. And it's basically the reason a lot of things can go through quickly is because if you're a corn plant, the, ask, the question is by putting in this segment of DNA, are you making a corn plant into a noxious weed? or uh, its relatives. So I, I want to hold myself off. What I'm getting at is that, that is, this is how I see the role of APHIS compared to the role of FDA currently today. In the future, it may change, but that's how I'm seeing it. And I think by having this new rule, we put the ball back in the court of FDA, which is the agency that has big authority and needs to step up to the plate. Um, elephant in the room from the scientific perspective, and this is a problem with the justification for some of the exemptions, but I'm, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be exempted, but we lack scientific evidence that transgenic plants are more likely to pose risks than cisgenic plants. We lack scientific evidence that of a relationship between the, the size of the genetic change and the likelihood of risk. And we lack scientific evidence that crops uh, developed through conventional breeding are less likely than engineered plants to become plant pests or noxious weeds. And we can discuss that, but I think there's, there's definitely an issue here. So I um, actually chaired this newer committee in 2016 on genetically engineered crops, experiences and prospects. And uh, when we put out that report, the New York Times reported that the most important thing from our report was that genetically engineered crops are safe, analysis finds. But that's not what we were saying. This is our press release. And the biggest piece that we wanted to get across to people is that the distinction between genetically engineered and conventional plant breeding is becoming less clear. And this is the commentary in that first section. New technologies in genetic engineering and conventional breeding are blurring the once clear distinction between these two crop improvement approaches. And basically the way I see it is that in 1996, when these plants first came on the market, this was a cell phone and that was a computer. And I could tell students in my class, no, 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 put away your cell phone, take your notes on your computer. But today it doesn't look like that because of course my students will say, what do you mean? I'm taking notes with my 
cell phone computer. Well, I think that's what's happened a little bit here in terms of genetic engineering. In the uh, response in, in the Federal Register, there's a quote that says, the term conventional breeding may generally be used interchangeably with traditional breeding. And then a lot of agencies have moved away from using the word traditional breeding to conventional breeding. But there's nothing traditional or conventional about why crosses, embryo rescue, protoplast fusion, mutation breeding, tilling, marker-aided selection or genomic selection. Some of these things have just appeared on the scene well after 1996. So they're not as old as transgenics. The other thing is that genetic engineering isn't the only technology that has changed. Genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics are all come on the scene. Remember that the human genome was in se was in sequenced in 1996. I mean, we're so far changed from that. So what I want to, again, put the ball in FDA's court here is in 1996, there was a lot of issue about whether it's process or product or something in between or what is going on. And I would say at that time, and when the rule came through, FDA was asking for testing on 60 components, including, you know, carbohydrates, minerals, uh, and, and other things, but 60 components. So it's very easy to say with a plant, plants have thousands of different chemicals in them, and some of them are toxins. So it's very feasible that something in the process led to a change in something other than those 60 components. So you could see why somebody would be concerned that we didn't have that scientific evidence. But today, with all of those genomic and proteomic and metabolomic things, we could test over 60,000 components and not for a lot of money. So things have changed dramatically in the same way that medicine has changed to personalize medicine stuff. You can get a fingerprint of every plant and find out if the crop you're looking at today is uh, equivalent to the crop that was bred 20 years ago or 40 years ago. So uh, back in 2016, the National Academy of Science report that I referred to said we need to move away from all of that. There's no reason to separate out what you call conventional breeding and what you call genetic engineering. That basically whenever you come up with a new variety, right, this variety here, you compare it to the varieties that are current. But I would say you could even you know, compare it to what you think is reasonable and go back 40 years and compare it to what would happen if you grew the seed out from those older varieties to see if you're getting the same thing in both things. And basically with using omics analysis, if you saw no differences or you saw differences that were ex you already understood, uh, that there would need to be no more testing. And it would be very much like uh, a quick uh, review. And this is more for health because with the environmental issues, it can be much more quickly done in terms of plant pests. But if you didn't understand those or if you couldn't interpret them, then it would need further testing. So I think that we need to recognize that we're not in 1996 anymore and we need to move forward in terms of probably really not just changing the USDA situation or uh, APHIS, which is very small, but changing uh, in some ways uh, the uh, whole coordinated framework to look at things in this uh, current year and looking forward. So I'll end by saying that um, I've talked to you about the technical support for these regulatory decision making, but the establish and maintenance of regulatory legitimacy at some point relies on the fact that you can be trusted that you're doing something that is actually scientifically accurate and appropriate. So the two things will work together. But sometimes I also do feel that trying to establish and maintain regulatory legitimacy pushes you away from the science. So there's a, a, an issue here because people have that sense that transgenics are, is what makes something risky. And if we continue that, which is becoming to me a bit of a myth, we have our researchers moving away from transgenics to try to convince the public that they're doing something safe because it's not transgenic. So you can be assured it's safe. And I'll stop there. Thank you. 
Oh, you're right. Heike, Heike is coming next. According to the slides. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. I will quickly share my screen then. Um, Why I have that. Okay. Can everybody see it? Yep, I, I see Cara too. <laughs> so um, I have uh, my, um, my group, my lab, we are an uh, academic research lab where we actually generate these transgenic. We do a mix of uh, basic research to figure out actually which genes to engineer, which genes to put in or which genes to edit. So essentially going from what, what most or many of the academic labs around the world do, uh, that deal with biotechnology or plant uh, basic um, molecular research is trying to figure out what all the components and genes actually do in plants and how we can use them or how the plant uses them and how we can um, use them to make changes. So um, overall, there are very, very few um, things that actually I think will impact our academic research um, with a, with a change to the SECURE Act, there may be a few things that, that will turn out to change, but as for our lab within the lab, um, these regulations have no, uh, no direct effect. Um, there may be small, because all everything we do in the lab, whether it's gene editing or, or uh, synthetic biology, where we introduce genes from, um, from different species or um, even synthetic genes, um, those things are, are regulated by um, NIH guidelines and we have to go and get approval for all our experiments and all our um, recombinant, um, research, recombinant um, DNA research uh, through the university. Uh, they have uh, the Environmental Health and Safety Administration has has so-called institutional biosafety committees that have to approve everything we do in the lab um, in terms of research. This is not uh, directly affected by USDA uh, guideline changes. The, um, however, um, what may be affected, um, but it's not a big effect, is, is getting uh, permission to, to ship uh, transgenic uh, seeds or plants across state lines uh, so that may there may be no further need for approval for gene edited lines um, synthetic biology so if we introduce uh, genes from foreign species that probably is still um, regulated the other thing is um, that uh, one of the things that is a big hindrance in when we do more applied research um, is to get industry interested in, in the research we do, or especially in, in traits we discover um, to, for commercialization is the ability to actually do field trials. And so far, um, it's, it has always been possible to do field trials, but the cost of field trials were fairly high because there were a lot of regulations associated with it. So we need permits um, that are um, issued by APHIS. They will still be necessary for most of the, uh, the, the transgenic plants or the genetically modified uh, plants and crops we will be testing or want to test in field trials. Um, so it's only a very small um, amount of plants that carry the single uh, nucleotide um, exchanges or deletions um, through gene editing that uh, may be permitted. So um, although the, the um, all agrobacterium transformation should be okay, but if you introduce foreign genes um, from other species, uh, that would still fall under the need to for you for APHIS permits, uh, but so there may be a small group of of uh, plants that will no longer um, need permits for field trials, which would make it cheaper to do field trials. And the thing is that companies are usually really only interested um, in trades when you can show effects in the field. If it's just in the greenhouse or growth chamber, you see some difference in, in, in stress response or yield or pathogen uh, resistance. Usually um, that is not enough to get um, 
commercial entities interested in in uh, looking at your um, uh, your crops or your patent. So one thing that may change, there was a lot of research going on or invested into research to try and develop methods that avoid, avoid plant pests, so agrobacterium in the transformation process. Um, some uh, like protoplast transformation with uh, directly with Cas9 and RNA, where there's no change to the um, DNA itself, and it's a transient process, but this is a very complicated process um, uh, because you need to, mostly because of the need of regeneration of protoplasts or other tissue culture into fully mature plants, which is still a very, very much a bottleneck for most um, genetic engineering of plants, or many at least. Um, so that is um, the... That is um, the, the major effect uh, would be the, the ability to do some field trials without long uh, or uh, more complicated um, regulations. Um, and again, the, the interplay with industry here, which is what would change, I think, or could change is that uh, we would be able for those that are no longer regulated um, or that would be approved through the um, uh, review process um, that academia could actually directly interact with farmers or farm organizations if they are very specific um, traits that they're interested to move between different organisms. Let's say we know a gene that is injured that can be gene edited through gene edited, modified in a way either inactivated or hyperactivated so that it, it would um, uh, confer drought tolerance, and you could move it from a potato into a soybean if the mechanism is the same, or into a blueberry or a carrot. And so if that is a conserved mechanism, um, it may be interesting to see if, if farmers or farm organizations would start um, to directly interact with smaller companies or farm companies or interact with academia to uh, to generate these very specific um, uh, requests or interests and, and directly um, distribute from, from lab to farm. Whether that's acceptable, societal, that's a whole different question. But I think um, the law might um, allow this for several, or the changes in the SECURE Act may um, enable that for several um, different crops. The other thing is, um, uh, patentability, but um, in the in recent years, gene edits, especially single nucleotide uh, polymorphisms, were no longer um, be patentable. We got several patent application requests, and they were commented by the U.S. Uh, PTO saying that these um, single nucleotide uh, changes uh, could occur. Uh, randomly by chance without genetic engineering. And that certainly is true, although, although the chance would be very, very low, uh, but that was an argument. And so uh, most of these plants could only be protected then by plant patents. Um, and so the question is how will that affect um, the interest for com of companies to use these um, systems. Gene editing, the mechanisms itself are patents. So to use this and commercialize it, you still have to license patents. Uh, so that would be something that mostly only companies can afford. Um, but I, my hope is that uh, it will enable more smaller companies, um, startup companies that could come out of academia where graduate students have an interest or, or postdocs to go ahead and, and form their own company for very specific uh, trait modifications that can be achieved in a way that um, the regulation is minimal. And um, therefore you can actually um, think about a commercial company or commercializing products coming out of your, your academic research. Thank you. And I will hand it over to Keith. Are we almost done? 
So when I, I first heard about this, I was hoping that uh, this is a, a chart I use in my class uh, to explain to students about which uh, which uh, plant manipulations are regulated and which ones are not. And I was sort of hoping that maybe it would move CRISPR totally out of the regulated. Uh, I think a lot of people were, but uh, it, it, it's only certain cases, as Jennifer described, uh, that it's moving more out of the regulated umbrella. So I tried to talk to some growers about what they thought about this. And if it, when I talk to growers, the main thing they're interested in when I try to talk to them about it and explain maybe the, the what might happen because of this um, uh, revision is they would like to see more competition. They would like to see particularly smaller companies and maybe academics like Heike, uh have more of a chance to compete with some of the big companies. They're concerned about competition. Uh, I talked to some, some people in, co in companies and in general, they're, I think, digesting what's gonna happen. Um, some felt that it's a very narrow definition. Uh, for example, one base pair, uh, what Fred talked about, uh, the difference between a transgene and a cisgene. Um, and that it could end up being an increase in regulations over am I regulated, uh, where there's no transgene pre present, which uh, many of, the, of our competing agricultural, the, the countries that we compete with agriculturally uh, operate under, such as Chile and Brazil, Argentina. Um, so I read uh, Jeffrey's uh, uh, thing, and one thing I thought that, uh, that I thought was interesting. He said that the problem with the argument is that science-based regulatory system should base its oversight on whether the plant possesses traits that make it a potential plant risk, not the plant's method of production. And, and this is something that I hear from industry and, and something that I've always thought that it would be um, uh, positive to move more towards a product-based uh, regulatory system. Um, and uh, this really doesn't do that. Um, Fred mentioned the elephant in the room. One of the elephants I think in the room are that products uh, that uh, are, should be regulated with similar risks should be regulated in similar ways. Uh, and certainly uh, I don't think that's true. Um, Another thing that Jeff said is the second problem is the developer self-determines if its product qualifies for an exemption, exemption and this could set, set up a, a financial incentive to avoid that. Um, I've talked to several com companies about that and uh, they all tell me that they're not gonna self-determine, that they won't, just like uh, with uh, the FDA now and, and the, uh, uh, the voluntary system there, they want they want that stamp uh, for legal reasons and for trade reasons. And you know, most of these most of the companies are dealing with commodities that are traded in a lot of countries. They're going to have to deal with a lot more regulatory uh, uh, systems than just the United States system. And those commodities are moved in huge volumes. Uh, as you see here, so they they have to uh, they have to deal with the regulatory system across the world uh, for the global supply. So they they would not be interested in uh, self determining. I've looked on uh, the internet a lot since we we decided to do this to try to get a little better feel for where uh, how this. Uh, these revisions might affect industry, what industry's thoughts uh, about that might be. And we don't see much from industry. And when I talk to industry, it sounds like they're sitting back and, and they're they're hoping that USDA will do a, a fairly broad interpretation of this and not so narrow as I mentioned earlier. But one of the things I keep saying is transparency and the lack of transparency. Um, and so that brings up that, the elephant in the room of, you know, uh, what the transparency concerns when a mutation 
with more than one single nucleotide is uh, achieved during with uh, natural selection or mutation breeding. And at what point does the technology become t tested and familiar enough that rest less regulatory rigor is needed? This is a paper that just came out. In fact, this is a preview that sort of illustrates, uh, uh, you know, where we're at today um, with some of our techniques that we can use instead of in, in terms of uh, unintended consequences. And this is with uh, SNPs. Uh, and you can see on the left there how many uh, uh, SNPs you can have with uh, conventional breeding and EMS. That would be, that's a, a form of uh, mutation breeding compared to genome editing. So that sort of goes to what Fred was talking about with his cell phone and his computer. Fred, I've got a picture of my old cell phone that was way bigger than that, the, the car phone. Um, so we should look at, I think, uh, especially in academia, we tend to look at conflict of interest as, as only something that happens from the companies and the and big business point of view. But we should really look at it from all angles. Regulators and, and activists have financial incentives and other motives to not favor reduced regulation. Um, so that's the comments I have, and I will turn it over to Zach and whoever's next. And I am next. This is Jason Delborn, and I'm just in the process of sharing my screen. Alrighty, I'll try to be rather brief since we're a little uh, running a little behind time. Um, I'm going to talk just about a couple of the issues um, about public engagement um, that this new ruling raises for us. So the first is just a note, um, and I believe uh, Jennifer Kuzma addressed this in her presentation, that there is a public comment period around uh, new rulemaking. And one of the questions is, um, thinking about the public comment period for this new rule, did it, uh, did it achieve a kind of public engagement um, for thinking about this change? Um, there were 6,150 comments that were submitted on the re federal register um, between the time that the proposed rule was, uh, was announced and the time that it, it, uh, comments were um, the end of the comment period. But this is from the USDA website that most of the comments, while not form letters, expressed a generalized, similarly themed opposition to GE products. So this is interesting because the USDA um, is required to only really pay attention to comments that address the kinds of issues that trigger their rulemaking or their, um, um, their oversight. And so these generalized themed opposition uh, comments to GE products really weren't allowed to make much of a difference in terms of this decision making. And in fact, the USDA went on to say of the comments that specifically address the provisions of the rule, approximately 25 expressed some support for the rule. Um, so this is a really strange uh, sort of photo of the public engagement process about this rulemaking. We have over 6,000 comments, but most of them essentially are, um, are dismissed because they don't address the particular provisions of the rule um, that's under consideration. Instead, most of the comments addressed a larger public concern about genetically engineered organisms. And we can certainly discuss whether or not that, um, wh where that kind of concern stems from, whether that's a scientific concern or a concern that's based on values. But the important thing here is that in engaging the public about this rule, we didn't get very high quality engagement about um, what the public was concerned about. And I'll just mention too, that these processes of uh, public comment periods are arguably very superficial ways to engage the public about these issues. Um, you have to know about this, you have to be following the issue, you have to be willing to take the time to submit the comment. There's not a back and forth dialogue that's created, you submit a formal comment and it's supposed to be considered. So these are, many people have argued, very inadequate ways to engage the public about um, changes in rule and policy. So one of the, th what, what can public engagement do or what could it have done um, in this case in thinking about changes to rules about genetically engineered crops and food? One of the possibilities of engagement is that it can build trust. Um, and here is just a quote from uh, Jennifer Doudna, who's one of the co-inventors of CRISPR. This is one in her public comment um, during this rulemaking period. And she says that while we recognize the agency's rational, rationale behind self-determination, 
and desire to provide regulatory relief in order to spur innovation. We are concerned that rather than stimulating innovation, such an undisclosed step, which is about uh, the, the ability to, to um, have, uh, make your own exemption without necessarily uh, receiving USDA's approval, may have the effect of dampening trust through the loss of transparency and the development and oversight process. And so here we see one of the real proponents of the technology recognizing that the way that this rule was promulgated may actually uh, reduce trust instead of building trust. The second thing that engagement can do, I think, is uh, to engage the public or broader audiences about issues of risk tolerance. So risk tolerance is not simply a scientific issue. It's a values-based issue. Um, and here we have a really interesting part of the rule that both Jennifer and Fred and Keith, uh, all of them alluded to, which is that one gene edit um, is exemptable, but two gene edits is unacceptable and requires um, a, a more formal review. This is really about risk tolerance in some ways. Um, it feels rather arbitrary um, as we see it in the rule as stated, um, but one possibility is that through a more broader engagement process, we might be able to understand what are, what are the reasons or the rationale for delineating what is an acceptable risk and what is an unacceptable risk in terms of how the rule is, is uh, put into practice. And lastly, I'll just mention that engagement has the possibility to attend to the kind of distributional impacts of policymaking or rulemaking. Um, and here I'm calling attention to um, just one detail of the rule as it was announced, which is that major crops like corn and soy and alfalfa and cotton are allowed to go into the new process for, for, um, uh, for review about six months prior to the smaller crops like berries. Um, and this has an impact on the smaller companies or smaller uh, stakeholders who are, who are pursuing gene edited crops in minor crops. And so I attended a webinar um, on Monday where a representative from the company Pairwise was describing their interest in using gene editing to change blackberries. Um, and they saw a kind of valley of confusion ahead where the MI regulated process is going away, but their ability to enter the new USDA procedure uh, doesn't, isn't permitted to them until October of 2021. Um, so, I mean, this is just one small detail, and of course it will go away in about a year and a half, but it's a reminder that a broader engagement of interested stakeholders and publics may reveal the kind of distributional impacts of a policy prior to making that rule final. And I will end there in the interest of time. Great, thanks, Uh Tom, you're up. Okay. Um, so I wanna take my five minutes to reflect on the thousands, if not millions of people marching in the streets of America calling for racial justice and equality in the midst of a pandemic that has laid bare the economic and health disparities in this country and a government that has been trampling on people's rights, further dissolving our trust in our institutions and one another. I struggle to understand the silent and systematic systemic racism that my partner is confronted with every day because of his skin color against the privilege I have grown up with and still benefit from simply based upon my own skin color. While this may not seem that a USDA rule regulating GMOs connects to this, I believe it does. It speaks more broadly to the inequalities about who gets to participate in the development and oversight of science and technology, and whether or not we trust those making decisions. The USDA's mission is to provide economic opportunity through innovation, helping rural America to thrive, to promote agricultural production that better nourishes Americans, while also helping feed others throughout the world, and to preserve our nation's natural resources through conservation, restored forests, improved watersheds, and healthy private working lands. We currently sit here at North Carolina State University, a public land grant institution founded in 1887 with the belief that colleges should not be reserved for a select few and that the children of farmers, mechanics, and other workers should have the access to the opportunities and benefits of higher education. NC State will soon open the Plant Science Initiative, 
with a $160 million facility whose website states, we are bringing together the brightest minds in academia, government, and industry to drive vital research and innovation that increases crop yields, creates new varieties, extends growing seasons, enhances agricultural and environmental sustainability, and produces new and improved technology, all valuable and honorable goals. But imagine for a moment if the focus was instead on small, underserved farmers and communities, helping to bridge the gap of food insecurity, economic fairness, and expanding access to science and innovation pipelines by providing opportunities for those left out, enabling them to participate in the research, training, and innovation in order to create new varieties, extend growing seasons, enhance agricultural and environmental sustainability, and produce new and improved technology. I cannot say that if local farmers or those traditionally left out of the innovation pipeline were to be directly involved in the development of genome editing, if it would help achieve greater trust amongst consumers around GMOs. But what I do know is what we are currently doing is not working to build that trust or address the inequalities in science and technology. I'm often asked about the DIY bio community, what it is, why it matters, is it safe, and why should everyday citizens be able to use these technologies? My answer or question really is quite simple. Why should the science and technologies that are built upon public dollars and public institutions be limited to industry and those with privilege? The DIY bio community operates by the following principles, openness, equality, respect, collaboration, and community. My hope is that as we continue to advance our understanding and use of genome editing, along with the further development of science and technology, that our governments, public institutions, and governance systems better reflect those principles. We have, we have been given the opportunity, responsibility, and honor to educate, must do better, to alleviate the social injustices, unequal power dynamics, and economic inequalities that are gripping our society and are all too prevalent throughout our institutions. We, as people in positions of power and privilege, and who have the capacity to influence science, technology, and the governance systems that oversee them must do better. Then, and only then, can we begin to have an honest, equal, fair, and transparent conversation about how science and technology is developed, governed, and used. Thank you for letting me share my thoughts. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Thank you, Todd, that was very moving. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time to share those uh, deep thoughts with us. So in my five minutes, and I know we're a little bit running out of time, so I'll try to be brief. Um, my goal is really to provide a brief comparative perspective with other emerging technologies. Um, and more specifically, what have we learned thus far from other fields? Well, we've learned that particularly top-down risk governance approaches are best when they couple technological assessments like risk assessments or safety assessments along with societal values and a hard, um, robust communication effort as well. So such a framework could look something like this, where you would have these two spheres um, coupled together that are within a larger context within uh, of communication and stakeholder engagement, which Jason was discussing earlier. And this is also um, achieved in an iterative process. So one such approach has been put forward by the International Risk Governance Council with their risk governance uh, framework that they've um, put forward and applied to several case studies. Another top-down risk governance um, approach is based on the four principles of responsible research and innovation. We've heard a little bit about these four principles from Jason and Jennifer and Todd right now. Um, primarily, the need for 
having diverse and inclusion practices to ensure that there's an early involvement of a range of actors to increase the different types and, and quality of knowledge. Um, the use of anticipation and reflection to ensure that potential impacts and underlying assumptions are easily identified and also improves our ability to act on available knowledge. Also the concept of being open and transparent, it helps us um, have a robust communication along the innovation stages to ensure there's public scrutiny and dialogue, as well as a fourth pillar of responsiveness and ad adaptive change. This helps us um, have practices that are able to be changed in light of new knowledge, circumstances, or perspectives. So coupled with these more top-down risk governance approaches, you could also um, use more bottom-up, what I'm calling bottom-up best practices for risk governance. And these include things like the code, codes of conduct that, are, um, that could outline different rules, normative behaviors, and maybe principles of uh, standard professional conduct. This has actually been uh, developed in several emerging tech fields. Um, especially in cases where there's been absence of effective oversight. Last year, colleagues and I also published a paper in Nature Nanotechnology that included five best practices for risk analysis of emerging technologies. And I wanted to share two, with, uh, two of these with you today. These were um, among these five are the, the need to share data while also protecting privacy, confidentiality, and propriety or information as well as the need to develop strategies to address uncertainties in risk and decision-making. Okay, so with these lessons unlearned, um, with these lessons in mind, I wanted to look back at the secure rule. And I find that the secure rule may be challenged in adhering to several of these points that I brought up. So first, um, given the flow of information provided by biotech developers to USDA through the secure process, it may be ineffective in communicating to diverse audiences, does not appear to have a robust mechanism to incorporate societal values, and does not appear to have an iterative approach for dealing with unforeseen circumstances um, or new information. Further, SECURE does not seem to strongly adhere to the four principles of RRI since mechanisms for all these pillars seem to be lacking. However, at the same time, there does seem to be some promise in terms of um, having the ability to establish codes of conduct from biotech developers, if there is will and trust among developers, and also if there's a model or um, uh, approaches could already be adapted to do this. Second, it seems like we could help um, share some of the data while protecting, protecting privacy, confidentiality, and IP, assuming that there is trust between actors, as well as suitable data infrastructure available. Finally, it seems that there could be strategies developed to help um, prepare for uncertainties and risk and decision-making. This could include things like um, including or complementing risk assessments, with uncertainty assessments, the use of dynamic risk evaluation and management, or even these broader RRI frameworks uh, pillars that I mentioned before. Thank you. Okay. Um, so that's, um, that brings us through all of our speakers. Uh, looks like we've got just under 20 minutes uh, for discussion at this point. Um, I wanted to, uh, I. I think I got one question uh, harvested off of the chat here uh, from, let's see, I wrote it down, uh, from Greg Jaffe um, to Fred. Um, so I don't know if you see that, if you saw that in the chat box, Fred, but the question was, I agree that the FDA should have a larger role in oversight than the USDA. Um, however, their oversight to date has been voluntary. Are you advocating that they have, a mand that they have mandatory oversight? Yeah, I guess I'm saying something a little bit broader about the um, whole coordinated framework in, in my comments. But I guess what I would want to bring back, there's a reason for them to actually have mandatory uh, oversight right now, uh, because we had a discussion about this yesterday. Um, if it's a voluntary system through FDA, and now for certain things, it's a voluntary system through USDA, there are products that could come out through the United States that are unidentifiable and uh, don't th go through any regulation. And that could harm uh, the US's ability to export uh, goods. So I think that 
we've set ourselves up in a situation now where it's, unless it goes through EPA, it's the possibility, not that everybody won't go through the permitting process, but it's a possibility. So I think that FDA needs to step up. I want to um, try to play referee here. Yeah. Patty's helping me out. So Can I look, just add a comment Sorry. to that? The, the other thing about FDA is they don't deal with ecological impacts, Fred. So yeah. I'm, I'm curious about how you feel that that would be handled then. If well, that's why I say it's, it's a whole issue with the current uh, system is that the role for USDA, which is we think of in, uh, as having the environmental piece and as well as EPA, their mandate is so small that it really doesn't cover those things. So I think we have to really rethink where we're going. You know, again, the, you know, it was brand new in 1986 or 87 when we were making these things. And I really applaud USDA for making, the, you know, APHIS for making these changes, which are much better. But I think we have to go further. All right. So um, just try to go through these in the order in which they appeared here. So there was a... Um, I guess Pranjali Vishwakarma had raised her hand uh, during the, one of the talks. And so she, if that individual wanted to post their question or speak, speak up, I should unmute you. Okay, not seeing that right now. So uh, the next question we had, or the one in the chat box, I'm having trouble. Actually, Patty, you might have to watch the hands because I'm watching the chat box and it's hard for me to look at them both at the same time. Um, so I'm tending to look at the chats more than the hands. So after, despite my instructions to you all. So the chat box question I see is um, earlier was uh, from Ray, I think, Ray, uh, how big a, of a database is needed for omics to be informative for metabolomics? Uh, there are huge differences even between plants in the same field. And uh, I think maybe Fred could handle that one first. So. All right, I'll, I'll go after that. Nobody is saying to compare individual varieties. The question is, if you know, we have to decide on what we're comfortable with. If we're comfortable with the plants and the foods that we were eating in 1968, then that could be the standard. Anything could be the standard. What is in the grocery store varies dramatically, right? You know that based on tasting them. But the issue is, is something outside the norm, not whether there's a small difference, but whether there's something that's really different. And I guess that's the question about big and small changes. We do know that all you have to do is one nucleotide base substitution, and you could change a protein that's involved in an enzymatic reaction that changes a lot of different things in the plant, right? So if such a thing happened, you could detect that very rapidly, and that's the idea. I think the next question in the chat, Zach, is the detail about secure for interstate movement. Yes, yeah, that's, so that's Matthew Williams. Yeah, I can, I can take that one. So um, someone asked about the secure rule for interstate movement of biotech crop seed or plants. And essentially the whole system is, is, is predicated on, on interstate movement. And let me just put up the, I'm gonna share just that one slide again on the secure rule. Um, so can, can you all see my screen or did I not share it? Well, anyway, the, the permitting process, so what happens with SECURE now is you have all these exemptions, and if you're exempt, you can move it interstate. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, most of our regulations in the United States are based on interstate commerce, as I, your question is picking up. So, so if you're exempt, if you have the single bear substitution or single base pair um, substitution, the, the homologous repair, or it's already in the gene pool, feel free to move it interstate. And that's your self-exempt pathway or your USDA confirmed pathway. If it's, um, if it's potentially achieved by conventional breeding, but not in the gene pool currently, you have to check in with USDA and they have 12 months, I believe, to review it. And then likely they will create new categories of exemptions for things that could be approved through conventional breeding are done through conventional breeding, and then you can move it in state. Um, through the regulatory status review, if it gets in 
the permitting process, do you have to worry about moving it across state lines? I hope that clarifies your question, Matthew. And I, I think I'm, I think I'm right on that. But if others like Greg Jaffe or I saw Stan Abramson on here too a while back, and several others, um, you know, feel free to put in the chat box to clarify that point I just made. Other panelists want to respond to that at all? That was more of a clarification question, so yes. Uh, so Adam Kakotovich looks like had the next question in the chat box. Um, so, um, so this is more for those of you who have, I'm just going to read this aloud, just to make it easier. This is more for those of you who have thought about risk assessment. What ecological potential adverse effects from new products of gene editing are you most concerned about? Uh, given all of the exemptions, the lack of a case-by-case -case consideration, and the voluntary nature of USDA cons consultation. In other words, what potential harms from the products of gene editing are you most concerned about? Because these products won't be receiving the assessments they should be receiving. So that's a kind of gets to the heart of what I'm personally probably concerned about. So uh, does anyone else want to take that? I'll, I mean, I'll do quick. Um, so I'm most concerned about uh, crops that have weedy relatives or could become weeds themselves, like grasses, switchgrass, there's switchgrass that's been approved, there's pennycress, there's the creeping bent grass, um, ones that have potential weedy relatives or are, can become weedy in themselves, having more traits like drought tolerance or better seed dispersal or higher growth or better ways to grow. That's one risk that I don't think is going to be well covered because it's not, may not technically be a plant pest risk, but it could be in broader ecological or risk to other farming systems. So that's the, the biggest scientific risk that I, and there are several of those already in the MI regulated inquiry process. You can go there and look them up and there's there's a, a great diversity of trees. There's trees too, apple trees, grapevines, plum trees, lettuce, apple, just a really diverse group of crops that are coming down the pipeline that may or may not go through a permitting process and maybe some may be exempt if they're gene edited. Anybody else, any other panelists want to have a response to that question? I'll just add that I, and maybe Jennifer was referring to this, um, the audio was a little garbled for me, but um, you know, for, for gene edited plants that are not aimed at agricultural environments, but more unmanaged environments, we might have more questions about their ecological impacts and whether that's forests or other types of environments. Um, it's not clear exactly how those will be considered. Uh, it doesn't seem that USDA would play much of a role. And maybe that's appropriate, but um, that would be a, a set of concerns. Yeah, but Jason, wouldn't they still go through, uh, through a, uh, a process with FDA and EPA? I know it's voluntary, but but that would be would um, evaluate risks. So well, I don't a, I don't think I see any bigger risk with gene editing than with any conventionally bred um, bread line. So I you know, things like higher yield, Jennifer, or drought tolerance are things that have people have been breeding for forever. You know, um, so. I, I don't see that gene editing as a technology provides a greater risk than, than, than conventional breeding at all. I mean, that's what conventional breeding does. It uses, um, tries to induce mutations through either radiation or chemicals or, or natural um, um, processes, which, happen, which is the basis for all our uh, survival here. But, and then, um, uses these and selection to, to breed for exactly those so-called SNPs that will then generate better, better crops. And I, I wouldn't consider those as, as weediness or overtaking um, agriculture or wild, um, wild and environment, natural environments at any bigger risk than anything that has been done in the last few hundred or thousand years. Yeah, and that may be a separate discussion um, as to what you capture within a regulatory system. Um, but if you're going to capture genetically engineered crops and pay particular attention to them, then those are the risks that I would be worried about. Are they unmanaged ecosystems or cross-pollinization with weedy relatives? Yeah. Any other uh, thoughts on that before I move to another question? 
So I'm going to mix it up a little bit because I got a couple raised hands here and maybe I want to just hear some audio for some participants. So um, I'm going to uh, say Abu, Abu Bakbar, Bakar Gumi. I'm going to lower your hand and unmute. Oh, sorry. I think I lowered your hand without unmuting you. That many disappeared. There we go. Should be, should be able to unmute yourself now and ask your question if you'd like. Hello. Yes. Please, regarding the USDA regulations on GMO, why is it that most concern centered on uh, test DNA? Thank you. Sure. Um, again, it was under the coordinated framework, um, they were trying to use existing laws in 1986. And so the Federal Plant Pest Act at the time, which was uh, an older version than the 2001, but because the first regulations for genetically engineered crops were 1987, 1993, um, they used that particular law as the regulatory hook. So I think it's a good question um, to the developers of the coordinated framework as to why that particular law was was used in the in the coordinated framework to 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 suggested to USDA to use as the regulatory hook for genetically engineered crops. And sometimes these older laws don't necessarily fit the risks that you're most concerned about with um, with genet with new products, new biotechnology, or other new technological products. So it's kind of somewhat of an artifact, in my opinion. In my opinion, but you know, I, I'd be happy to hear others' viewpoints on that as well. Okay, thank you. Because I was just yeah. curious to know yeah. whether it's the only concern. Yeah. I'm go back to uh, from Jolly Vishwa Karma because she raised uh, the, that individual raised their hand, so I'm asking them to unmute themselves. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my question is that uh, it's for Jennifer. Is uh, uh, that in new regulations, same plants or host traits are given exemptions? What is basis for these exemptions? Yeah. Well, others who read the rule can comment too. Um, I think it's, you know, experience with USDA already having reviewed that in some form or another, or it's it, either through the MI regulated process or through the permitting and notification or deregulation process. So I think they're trying to say, you know, the, the place where the gene lands doesn't matter as much as long as you're, we already have experience with that combination of plant trait and, and um, mode of action. Um, and I think that's probably a decent scientific argument, although, you know, we, we are concerned about off-target effects of where the gene lands or gene editing as well. Um, but if you're going to have to cut something off, it seems to make some scientific sense. But I think others can, that's my opinion, um, others can comment on that as well. Any other comments? On that? I think familiarity is probably the, the main principle there. Okay, and the second thing which I would like to ask, like uh, weediness, weediness or invasiveness has been also given exemptions. Don't you think it would lead to like uh, introduction of certain variety which are native to your uh, country? Because this was the main concern not to introduce native variety. I don't know, does Keith want to take that one? or? or Heike, who have more? plant biology expertise, current plant biology expertise than I do right now. So you're talking about uh, introducing a, um, um, uh, a, gen a gene edited crop where we have a native species where the, in the center of origin, is that what you're talking about? No, I, I would I would uh, was talking as Jennifer showed in one of the slide that weediness or invasiveness uh, will means will not be a criteria anymore for assessment, and it will be given exemption. So what did lead probably, to? I should probably clarify a little bit in the uh, regulatory status review. 
USDA is going to ask the crop developer for information about weediness and wild relatives. However, it's unclear how they're going to deal with that because the determination is really about plant pest risk. But you're correct. They didn't invoke the noxious weed authorities at, as they tried to do in previous attempts to, to revise the rule. Uh, and it, it's a concern of mine. But again, I don't have the plant biology, the current plant biology expertise to answer or fully understand your question. But I, I'm, I am concerned about impacts on native plants that may be related to the genetically modified plant. Thank you very much. Others may not be. I mean, and again, Heike had brought up the very good point that there might not be any greater risk than conventionally bred plants, which is, I think, valid as well. But um, it could be that if you are going to focus on genetically engineered plants, then you might as well, you know, pick one of the major risks in order to focus your regulatory system on. But that's just my opinion. So go ahead, Keith. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, as far as uh, native plants, um, uh, certainly that's a concern a lot of people have. And thankfully, in the United States, we're, we're not the center of origin for much, uh, but we are for sunflowers. And we've had mutation breeding for in sunflowers, and it's grown right in the center of origin. So that goes, uh, to me, that goes back to that big elephant in a room uh, where reg we would regulate that maybe differently with genetic engineering or, or gene editing than we would with other forms of breeding where the concerns would really be the same, the risk. So I see um, we're at uh, the end of our schedule and time right now. We've got well over 20, at least 20 comments that I've left unaddressed in the, in the chat box here and a couple of raised hands. So um, we could probably go on with this discussion for quite a while. Um, and I guess, as my role as timekeeper, I need to bring this meeting to a close, unfortunately, because I'd like to hear everybody's comments, but I need to go listen to our Dean talk now. So um, I could, I don't know. If, uh, we could maybe think about doing some Q&A responses to the comments, you know, on our website or something. On the maybe? website, yeah. yeah. So these comments we have uh, a record of now, or we can save this, and uh, maybe it would be worth, as, as the GES Center, going through them and, and um doing our best to reach out to a couple of folks with answers yeah. or post a fact or something like that. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll look, we'll look through your comments. You have not submitted them in vain. <laughs> we'll see what you've, uh, see what you've asked. So uh, thank you again very much for everybody for attending. Let's thank our panelists. Uh, you can hear me clap. <laughs> um, I learned a lot. I, I was worried we wouldn't have enough questions. So I had my own written down, but I didn't get a chance to ask them. So. Um, so I hope everybody has a good summer and thank you again for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday. Thank you. Thanks, Zach Bye. and Jennifer and everybody. Patty, thank you the most, Patty. You were fantastic with putting those links up. No problem. Y'all have your expertise and I have mine. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, Thank you everybody. Uh, will those links all be available? The will links the will all be available. I'm going to add them uh, when I post the video. Um, I also usually put links in the podcast description if anybody is subscribed to our podcast. So um, we'll have a lot of extra comments and links and stuff to add to things. It'll probably take us a little longer than usual to get things posted, but um, it'll be on our website at the go.ncsu.edu forward slash GES. Way to get in a plug there. <laughs> yeah, and follow us on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Y'all have a good weekend.